Toothpaste sponsors in South Korea, tyre partnerships in Uruguay, the rampant commercialisation of a football club that emanated from a band of railway workers on the Lancashire and Yorkshire line. The man in the middle, Sir Matt Busby. He picked up the ball of owner James W. Gibson who delivered the philosophy of entrusting youth when he purchased the club in 1931. Since, Manchester United have been synonymous with their academy. The most prolific period for the Manchester United academy came under Sir Matt Busby, the first great Manchester United manager. The following film depicts the meteoric rise, the heartbreaking fall, and the most successful pinnacle of the Busby Babes. Manchester United were parachuted into the uncertainty of the interwar years thanks to their saviour chairman, John Henry Davies. His interest-free loans had effectively kept the club afloat and retained somewhat of a competitive edge. With his death in 1927, United were at the mercy of a crippling financial depression. It took five years for the club to be saved again, this time by textiles boss James Gibson. In his very first formalised meeting at the club, he laid down the club's philosophy, youth. In 1937, Manchester United had avoided the third tier of English football and the Junior Athletic Club was founded. The first team and reserves were now supplied by what would become a world-renowned academy. With a stream of talent, Manchester United retained their top-tier status just in time for the Second World War. They would be a very different club on the other side of it. Matt Busby was born in Orbiston on the outskirts of Glasgow in 1909. Upon his birth, the doctor proclaimed, a footballer has entered this house. His prediction came true. Busby enjoyed eight successful years at Manchester City, where he lifted the FA Cup in 1934, before transferring to Liverpool. Just exiting his peak, Busby was three years in twist into Anfield when the Second World War hit. A professional playing career exclusively at Main Road and Anfield, it was hardly the obvious foundations for a pillar of the Manchester United institution. In December 1944, with the war's conclusion around the corner, United needed a young manager to build their project. Club official Louis Rocca wrote to the Liverpool player, imploring him to consider a first job in management at Old Trafford. Before an agreement was reached, conditions had to be met. Busby wanted autonomy. In Busby's mind, this meant the absolute control of coaching appointments and player recruitment, as well as anything he regarded as important to the playing side of Manchester United. When faced with a three-year contract by chairman James Gibson, Busby demanded five. In secret, Busby signed the contract to become Manchester United manager in his army khakis. He was to be given a club house in Charlton, roughly equidistant between Main Road and Old Trafford. The only snag was that the prospective new United manager already had a verbal agreement in place with his current club Liverpool to become a player coach. With Liverpool of the belief Busby was destined to return to Scotland to begin his management career, the Anfield club agreed his release. By February 18th, 1945, the secret was out. Busby wouldn't receive his Anfield farewell and after a couple of games for the Forces team, he officially retired from playing. Before football returned, Busby initiated the first part of his conditions, coaching appointments. From a tour of Greece and Italy and South Europe during the final throes of the war, Busby met Jimmy Murphy, the man who would become his trusty assistant. Their job was to improve players already on the books, alongside player youth coach Bert Wally, as well as new recruits. Those recruits were signed under the keen eye of their new scout, Joe Armstrong. By 1948, the quartet had their first great Manchester United team and the club's first silverware since before the First World War. From the start of the reign, it was clear
clear that Matt Busby wasn't like most managers who would shun the idea of getting on the grass to coach. His attire on the training field hadn't changed much from his playing days, right down to the boots. He was the first ever tracksuit manager. The impact of the war, despite the upturning economy, had forced United to be more spendthrift than most. The bombing of Old Trafford forced United to ground share with neighbours Manchester City, and the rental costs at Main Road were an eye-watering £5,000 a year, plus 10% of gate receipts. Busby had a crash course in austerity in his first ever management role. Consequently, a training kit was bought with clothing coupons and fan donations. The only fee spent in his first team was £4,000 to Celtic for Jimmy Delaney, a 31-year-old who was said to have brittle bones. He would play 164 league fixtures for United over the next four years. It was a team largely recruited by Chief Scout Louis Rocker. Of the team that featured in the 1948 FA Cup final, only Delaney was purchased by Busby. The rest were very much moulded by him. Jack Crompton, John Aston Sr, John Anderson, Johnny Morris and Charlie Mitten were all recruited for the youth team prior to the war, but were only able to make their professional debuts afterwards. Meanwhile, Rocca signed the cup final captain Johnny Carey from a League of Ireland game in 1936 for just £250. Other Rocker recruits were Henry Cockburn and pre-war debutant centre-half Alan B. Chilton, Stan Pearson and Jack Rowley. The latter of which was the best example of Matt Busby's coaching. Jack Rowley was purchased before the war from Wolverhampton Wanderers for £3,000 as an outside left with 22 appearances for Bournemouth and Boscombe Athletic under his belt. His transformation into centre forward and scorer of 211 goals is completely the work of Busby. Only Wayne Rooney, Sir Bobby Charlton and Dennis Law have scored more goals for the club than Rowley. Another shining example of Busby's coaching ability was Henry Cockburn. The reserve player juggled his Manchester United responsibilities with a full-time job as a fitter at a cotton mill in Oldham. When Busby first saw him and changed him from an inside forward to a wing half, his career took off. He would play 243 league fixtures in nine years for the club. Busby raised the fitness levels of players and by 1947, the club was challenging for the league title again. The manager further endeared himself to supporters with his positive record against Liverpool. In three league matches in 1946, United recorded an aggregate scoreline of 12-1 that included two redemptive 5-0 batterings. Liverpool unfortunately would have the last laugh, with a 1-0 win over Busby at Anfield in May 1947 that proved the difference between the two sides come the end of the season. Liverpool claimed their fifth league title by a point from United, thanks in part to the enormous £12,500 fee spent on Newcastle's Albert Stubbins, who top scored with 24 goals. During the failed title bid amidst an injury crisis, the happy accident of John Aston Senior's career resurgence became a landmark of Busby's immense coaching eye. Previously a wing half and inside forward, Aston became a fullback, a position that he retained for the remainder of his career. Off the field, Busby could throw his weight around too. When former player and club director Harold Hardman complained about captain Johnny Carey, Busby confronted him in a toilet and lodged a complaint at the next board meeting entitled Interference from Directors. Chairman James Gibson backed Busby and the manager standing at the club took another incremental increase. Another battle won came against the chairman himself. Gibson had become emboldened by the success of Jack Rowley and the improved standard of football and wanted to splash the cash in the market. He pointed to Newcastle's transfer list at Len Shackleton. Busby stood his ground, citing the club's poor financial position and remained stern. After earning the respect of the chairman, Gibson wouldn't trouble him again. Busby now had earned the independence to run the club how he saw fit. However, the club endured a poor start to the following season that did include a 2-0 win at Main Road over Liverpool in the second game, but also featured a nine-match winless run. A terrific second half of the season didn't halt United's four-point regression from the prior season and seven-point deficit behind Arsenal. 
United's league form was not the story of their season, however. When the FA Cup started in November, United were laying low in 15th place after a 4-4 draw with Huddersfield Town. In an attempt to help a friend, Busby tips United to win the competition at long odds of 25-1. to By the time United entered the competition two months later, United hadn't lost in the league, were fourth and drawn at Villa Park in the third round of the cup. Johnny Morris and Stan Pearson helped themselves to doubles in a topsy-turvy 6-4 away day victory. The fourth round saw Liverpool eliminated 3-0 at the neutral Goodison Park due to City being drawn at home at Main Road. Meanwhile, United's newfound popularity attracted a Football League record crowd of over 81,000 in a 1-1 draw at their temporary home against eventual champions Arsenal. Another neutral venue was needed for the fifth round against holders Charlton Athletic. Whilst the Addicts wanted the home comforts of London, Busby elected a trip over the Pennines to Huddersfield's Leeds Road ground. 2-0 and United moved on to the sixth round, drawn Preston at home. North End had eliminated City, which meant that Busby's side could actually play the game at Main Road. 4-2 winners, United moved to Hillsborough for the semi-final against Derby County, who were jostling for a position in the top four alongside United. Stan Pearson was the hero of Sheffield, netting all three to confirm United's first ever trip to Wembley. Blackpool, led by the newly appointed first ever footballer of the year, Stanley Matthews, pre-arranged not to wear their tangerine orange. They met a Manchester United side in the FA Cup final on April 24th, donning the unusual colour of royal blue with white shorts. Within 12 minutes, United were a goal down. Alan Shilton had been simply bypassed by Stan Mortensen and the defender had to cynically bring his run to a halt on the edge of the penalty area. These days, it would be a simple red card and VAR would attribute the foul as a free kick. In 1948, red cards did not exist and the referee incorrectly awarded Blackpool a penalty. Eddie Shimwell converted it before Jack Rowley equalised before the half-hour mark. However, Blackpool would retake the lead through Mortensen himself on 35 minutes. The Omens read as terminal for Manchester United. No FA Cup final team had come from behind twice to win the trophy. This was Manchester United, however, and a 12-minute triple salvo from Rowley, Stan Pearson and John Anderson confirmed Matt Busby's first trophy at the club in a 4-2 win. Captain Johnny Carey revealed the club's motto, the ball must never stop, and it certainly didn't in one of the finer cup finals up until that point. They returned to the house of James Gibson with the trophy, who was absent from Wembley on doctor's orders. It was a victory built upon the DNA injected by Gibson himself. Seven of the team that defeated Blackpool had grown up in Manchester. Wolves needed a semi-final replay in front of 73,000 at Goodison Park to stop them returning the FA Cup the following year. Busby earned silver yet again in the league, finishing five points back on Portsmouth before 50 points only earned them fourth in 1950. It had become apparent that Old Trafford would need repairing and tiring of ground sharing with Manchester City. Busby had to tighten the purse strings. Compounded with a lack of quality in the reserve team, the manager resolved to supply his team, not with big signings as Liverpool and Derby County did, but with an increase in youth scouting. Louis Rocco was not getting any younger and finally Joe Armstrong was installed with the job title of Chief Scout. James Gibson may well have died in September 1951, but his philosophy was immortalised. The cup winning team was broken up. Johnny Morris sold to Derby for a world record £24,000, whilst Charlie Mitten eloped to the Rebel League of Colombia. By the time the league title was finally secured in 1952, only half of the cup winners from four years prior remained as first team players. The European era was around the corner and the youth recruitment drive was finally bearing some fruit. Matt Busby cast his line as far as the times would allow. Its result was the second great Manchester United team. The inauguration of the FA Youth Cup in 1952 coincided with the emboldening of the late James Gibson's approach and the utilisation of that approach from Matt Busby. 
1953 saw the first Youth Cup decided with United decimating Wolves 9-3 on aggregate. Included in Jimmy Murphy's teams for the two-legged final were Eddie Coleman, Duncan Edwards, Billy Whelan, David Pegg and Albert Scanlon. Almost 500 senior first-team appearances were contained within the team. 1954 saw Wolves beaten again, with Wilf McGuinness and Bobby Charlton used in both legs of the final, as well as most of the aforementioned names from the prior final. Shea Brennan would feature in the 1955 final win over West Brom as the club reaffirmed their dominance over the competition throughout the decade, winning five youth cups on the bounce. By the time Matt Busby had won his second league title in 1956, the team was almost unrecognisable from the 1952 who delivered his first championship. Mark Jones, Jackie Blanchflower and Roger Byrne had been the academy graduates who played 29 league appearances between themselves in the 1951 and 52 season. Meanwhile, Johnny Berry was the only survivor who commanded a fee, £25,000 from Birmingham City. United continued to harvest from their academy. Dennis Violet and Bill Folkes quickly came around after the first league triumph, whilst Jeff Bent were promoted in 1954. Meanwhile, Busby paid peanuts for Darlington goalkeeper Ray Wood before signing the prolific Tommy Taylor from Barnsley for a pound under 30,000. Together with the FA Youth Cup winners, United had teamed a successful football team with beautiful football. Ray Wood kept goal, although he would be replaced by a signing in the shape of Harry Gregg. The defence was solidified by club captain Roger Byrne and Bill Folkes, the midfield marshalled by Blanche Flower, Jones and Coleman, as well as the team's shining light, Duncan Edwards. Of the club's 15 top goal scorers, this version of Matt Busby's Manchester United contained three. Bobby Charlton, who would net 249, was a recent graduate, whilst Tommy Taylor and Dennis Violet would bag 310 goals in 484 appearances between them. The club's last defeat in the 1955-56 season came on January 21st away at Preston North End. 14 unbeaten ended the season and confirmed a quite frankly ridiculous 11-point gap to Blackpool. In the following season, United hit a ton of league goals, reached the final of the FA Cup against Aston Villa and almost achieved the same in their first European Cup campaign. Busby was a man of his time, adhering like many managers to the WM formation. However, if his team took a liking to one of the participants from the influential match of the century at Wembley in November 1953, between the humiliated English hosts and the triumphant Hungarian visitors, it was more so the latter. The manager would mature beyond the boundaries of the limited English game, evolving his system to incorporate a back four system that was popularised by the great Brazilian World Cup winning teams. On the continent, Chelsea had bowed at the might of the Football League, withdrawing their participation in the inaugural European Cup in 1955. The following year, the stubborn Matt Busby refused to take the same answer. Granted the blessing of FA Secretary and future FIFA President Stanley Rouse, Busby would take the first English club into Europe. In their very first European Cup tie, they would record a 10-0 thrashing over Anderlecht, a club record that still stands today. United's football matched some of the most regal European outfits. In the first round, Borussia Dortmund were edged out 3-2 in front of 75,000 at Main Road before a goalless draw in West Germany proved that this swashbuckling side could also defend. A mesmeric eight-goal thriller saw Athletic Bill Bow take a two-goal advantage back to England for the quarter-final second leg. On February 6th, 1957, Manchester United provided one of their most complete European performances overturning the deficit thanks to the goals of Johnny Berry, Tommy Taylor and Dennis Violet. The only team that could confidently say they stopped Manchester United that season were Real Madrid. 5-3 on aggregate, the vastly experienced Los Blancos retained their European Cup and would win the next three to reaffirm their status as the best team on the planet. Nine days later, Tommy Taylor's late goal wasn't enough to earn a first domestic double in the 20th century of English football, as Aston Villa ran out 2-1 victors in the FA Cup final. 
irrespective of those prohibitive hurdles, Manchester United were insatiable. Perhaps the best display for a team that would become known as the Busby Babes was their heartbreakingly final flourish on home soil. On February the 1st, 1958, days before they set out to Belgrade via Munich for a European Cup quarter-final, Manchester United travelled to Highbury to meet Arsenal. This fixture came two weeks after a 7-2 obliteration of Bolton Wanderers and a week following progression in the FA Cup. United had started slowly with clusters of defeats in the first half of the league season, most notably against Bolton, Blackpool, Wolves and Spurs. However, post-Christmas form had seen United return to their best. A lot of ground was to be made up against the great Stan Cullis Wolverhampton Wanderers team, but momentum appeared to be on United's side. 63,578 was the privileged number who bore witness to the Busby Babes for the last time in the league, trading nine goals with a highly competitive Arsenal outfit. Tommy Taylor netted twice and the trio of Bobby Charlton, Duncan Edwards and Dennis Violet also converged on the miraculous 5-4 triumph. Five days later, the Munich air disaster killed eight Manchester United players, two coaches, two journalists, club secretary Walter Crickmer and the co-pilot, as well as ending the careers of two further players, Johnny Berry and Jackie Blanchflower. Aside from losing two of his closest staff members, Tom Curry and Bert Wally, Matt Busby fought for his life in a Munich hospital. He wouldn't be back on the touchline in a formal basis until the following season. It was a team playing superlative football that hadn't even hit the heights that their football promised. They had taken to European football like a duck to water, overcoming the adversity of Eastern European trips to Prague and Belgrade to earn another semi-final. Put it simply, they were one of the best teams in Europe and one of the best to ever come from England in the sport's history. Of the eight that perished, there was the argument that only Roger Byrne, the club's captain, had peaked at the age of 28. Tommy Taylor had more than a century of goals at the club in him, age 26. Jeff Bent and Mark Jones, their careers ahead of them, 25 and 24 respectively. Whilst David Pegg had made his debut just over five years ago, he was barely 22. Billy Whelan only made his debut during the 1954-55 season. Eddie Coleman only became a first team member the following year and played 25 league fixtures aged only 19 in a championship winning year. He was 21, much like his partner in wing half, Duncan Edwards. Despite his youthful age, it can be confidently claimed that the Dudley-born midfielder is one of the greatest players in the club's history. Once the youngest to ever play in England's top tier, Edwards seemed destined to be the man to lift the European Cup for his club, and after already 18 caps for his country, the World Cup, when the tournament arrived on home soil in 1966. This was a team that had everything ahead of them that could have rewritten the history books of English and European football. Instead, Manchester United faced a rebuild under the cloud of the disaster. They somehow reconvened to finish within the top half of the league, appeared in the FA Cup final and took a lead into the second leg of the European Cup semi-final against Milan. A disaster that was entirely avoidable. A disaster that had its roots in desperate European returns from Bilbao and Prague in the prior 13 months. A January trip to snowy Bilbao had Matt Busby fretting over a postponement on a boggy pitch and the repercussions it could have for a league fixture three days later at Hillsborough. Eventually the match against the Spanish champions went ahead and after clearing snow and ice from their plane as well as a refueling in Jersey, United returned home and promptly lost to Sheffield Wednesday. Later that year, United secured another quarter-final with a slender defeat against Dukla Prague. Three days later was the trip to Birmingham City. Delays on the continent had United rerouted for an unplanned stopover in Amsterdam. Once again, the worries of punishment forced Walter Crickmer into a workaround on the fly. Via road, rail, ferry and road again, United arrived in Birmingham in the early hours of the match day, lucky to escape with a 3-3 draw. The head of the Football League took a hardline stance to any travellers back from European competition. 
He ruled that a team had to return to English soil 24 hours in advance of their next league fixture or face punishment. Without the knowledge of what punishment they could face, Matt Busby was faced with a slush-filled Munich runway and two failed attempts to take off from their refueling. His master plan of chartering a flight back from Belgrade to avoid delays had been ruined. It ought to have been a celebration, confirming a return to the European Cup semi-final, but quickly attention turned to how they would get home. Had the third attempt to take off not proved fatal, United would have returned home within the boundaries of the Football League's new rules. Had they waited until the snow cleared the following morning, they might have been late on the Football League's watch, but 23 lives wouldn't have been lost and the Busby Babes would have played on. In defeat at Wembley almost three months to the day in the FA Cup final against Bolton Wanderers, the club and indeed the city were emboldened by Matt Busby's public appearance on the touchline, imbued by the spirit of football like never before. In the immediate aftermath of the Munich air disaster, far beyond his dischargement from hospital in West Germany, Matt Busby struggled with the enormous weight of guilt. At times he would reason that because he had taken Manchester United into the European Cup that he was at fault for the disaster and that he ought to relinquish the manager's job. It took an incredible amount of character and assistant of another kind, his wife Jean, to continue and regain hope. It was five years before Manchester United were successful after Munich. For the first time in his managerial career, it was out of sheer necessity that they spent money. Albert Quicksall was the first big outlay after Munich, £50,000 from Sheffield Wednesday. Maurice Setters of West Brom and Noel Cantwell of West Ham joined for a combined £70,000 in 1960, whilst David Hurd was acquired from Arsenal, Paddy Crerand came in from Celtic and Dennis Law was spared from a tumultuous time on the continent, signed from Torino. It took a number of years for United's league form to correct itself. In the meantime, the competition in English football only intensified. Burnley had performed well in Europe, Alf Ramsey had taken Ipswich to the league title, and that's before the rejuvenations of Leeds under Don Revy and Liverpool under Bill Shankly, whilst Tottenham won a domestic double in 1961. Busby's United struggled in the bottom half, with 1963's 19th place finish his worst performance in his time at Old Trafford. Much like 1948's underperformance, however, it didn't tell the entire story of United's season. The duality of United's term was stark, as the fixtures piled up owing to a horrific winter of postponements, United saw off Huddersfield Town, Aston Villa and Chelsea inside 15 March days, but they lost their corresponding league ventures against Spurs, West Ham and Ipswich. Quicksall netted in every round of the cup thus far and his strike away at Coventry City in the quarter-final continued that streak. A pair of Bobby Charlton goals sent United through to Villa Park where they'd meet Southampton. Busby's side came into the match off the back of only a second league win all season at home to Wolves. Dennis Law nabbed the winner that day in front of a meagre 36,000 at Old Trafford. Five days later, the Scot got the goal that sent United through to their first cup final since 1958. Their top flight safety was only confirmed in the penultimate fixture of the season thanks to a 3-1 win over Leighton Orient at home. After a loss at Nottingham Forest, United finished two places above the relegated Manchester City and a place above the League Cup winners Birmingham City. Five days after the league season, United attempted to confirm their own trophy at Wembley, Leicester were the opponents, whilst United were hoping to win the trophy at the third time of Ascot. Of the team that lined up at Wembley in 1963, only Bobby Charlton and Bill Foulkes had survived the Munich air disaster. Along with Tony Dunn and Paddy Creran, they would be the only players that featured in United's next major final at Wembley in five years' time. Dennis Law, who would miss the European Cup final of 1968 through injury, was the predictable man to open the match as scoring on the half-hour mark. His 29th goal of the season proved his last. David Hurd's second-half double ended a five-year drought of trophies. Defender Bill Foulkes labelled the 1963 FA Cup the most single important trophy in the history of our club. 
United's next major incoming proved among the most important acquisitions that the club had ever made. Scouted on the other side of the Irish Sea, George Best joined the academy team in the early 1960s and only remained for two days because of his homesickness. When he returned, he came back for good, plying his trade for two years as an amateur before finally making his debut in September 1963 in a victory over West Bromwich Albion. He would form one third of the fabled Trinity. Alongside Bobby Charlton and Dennis Law, the trio were the most high profile collection of players that the club had ever seen and hasn't come close to witnessing since. They would win the two league titles as the Busby Babes did, but would go one further. The club has had groups of players flourish in the meantime, from the class of 92 to the Champions League winning triumvirates of Wayne Rooney, Carlos Tevez and Cristiano Ronaldo. However, never before or since had a collection of players shone so brightly together to the point that all three won the acclaimed Ballon d'Or award in the span of five years throughout the 60s. They currently make up one of three statues around Old Trafford, with space opposite them, dedicated to the manager they worked under and, around the corner, his successor. With the acquisition of George Best, the club returned to Youth Cup glory alongside Nobby Styles, David Sadler and John Aston Jr. What's more, the cup win over Leicester had imbued United back into the title picture. Seven unbeaten to start the 1963-64 season continued the feel-good factor of the cup final and whilst Dennis Law bagged 46 goals in all competitions, the club fell short of an unlikely treble. A return to Europe in the Cup Winners' Cup saw elimination at the hands of Sporting. The Portuguese club somehow overturned a 4-1 deficit in Manchester to win 5-0 back in Lisbon. Meanwhile, West Ham ended United's defence of the FA Cup at a Hillsborough semi-final and four points was the difference between Busby in second and Bill Shankly's Liverpool in first. Conversely, United started the subsequent season imperfectly winning one of the first five. Then they dropped just two points in the next 15 matches to lay down a championship marker. Semi-finals were achieved abroad and domestically. Frank Varos the stumbling block in the Fairs Cup whilst Leeds United were the opponents in a fiery FA Cup encounter that needed a replay at the City ground. Both were lost, but in key latter season victories away at Elland Road and at home to both Liverpool and Arsenal, Manchester United were champions for the fourth time under Matt Busby. In the 20th century, nobody had won more English league titles as a manager. Winning the championship was a catharsis, and it also meant that Manchester United were to play in the European Cup again, qualifying for the latter stages with wins in Helsinki and Berlin. In a 1966 quarter-final against Benfica, it proved the perfect platform for George Best, who was at his effervescent best. Whilst he scored two in a home preliminary tie in a match already won, Best's biggest impact in Europe came in Lisbon. Two goals and an all-round stunning performance over a team that had appeared in four finals in the prior five seasons made George Best a household name. A sombrero bought on a whim on the journey back home proved a lasting image, whilst El Beetle was the nickname that stuck for those on the continent. 5-1 in Portugal and 8-3 on aggregate, United had confirmed a first European Cup semi-final since that fateful week in Belgrade. That, alongside another run to the semi-final in the FA Cup against Everton, had fans dreaming of a treble. This team unfortunately couldn't juggle all three prospects, with title hopes evaporating with April defeats against Leicester, Sheffield United and West Ham, they'd ultimately finished fourth and needed a win in a cup competition to return to Europe. A daunting return to Belgrade was penciled in for the semi-final where United would meet Partizan in a 2-0 defeat. After defeats against Real Madrid and Milan in prior semi-finals, what was deemed an easier final for encounter was supposed to be the time Busby finally conquered Europe. Another academy graduate, Nobby Styles, got United's goal in return leg, ultimately not enough in a 2-1 aggregate defeat. Three days later, United bowed out of the FA Cup to Everton at Burnden Park. An undefeated second half of the season, stretching all the way back from a post-Boxing Day win at home to Sheffield United, until the crowning 6-1 victory that may at Upton Park, Busby was quick to claim his fifth league title the year after, and a quick return to the European Cup. 
The champions were now made up by Alex Stepney in goal and another fresh face off the academy wagon in Brian Kidd. They will both play in the showpiece event of the 1967-68 season. It wouldn't be the FA Cup final after third round elimination in January against Spurs nor a league title decider after a poor end to the season saw a March defeat at home to Manchester City and two losses from the final three games. As City celebrated the end of the league season with the famous trophy, United still had unfinished business in Europe. Early nerves saw United through against Yugoslavian and Polish opposition before United were drawn the mighty Real Madrid once more in the European Cup semi-final. George Best snatched the all-important winner in the last 16-second leg win over FK Sarajevo and emulated that in a famous Old Trafford victory against Los Blancos. He had recorded his best finish yet by scoring 32 goals. The job wasn't done yet as United travelled to the Bernabeu for the second leg. The first half was a disaster, Real Madrid ascending to a two-goal lead not only once but twice as the Spanish champions took a 3-1 scoreline into the second half. Time looked to be leaking out of United's European Cup bid, but with 17 minutes remaining, David Sadler found the net. Under the new away goals rule, it was enough to send United through to their first continental final. Making sure of that, Bill Fuchs, the fitting goal scorer of United's equaliser that posted the club back to Wembley at the end of the season to meet Benfica. The Portuguese outfit had been demolished in the quarter-final two years prior, which ought to have been a springboard to European success. Whilst they weren't the team of Bella Gutman and successive European Cups at the start of the decade, they could now boast one of the world's best strikers, Eusebio. He carved out the best Benfica chances early on, whilst the Portuguese club remained resolute in the first half. That would soon be undone as Bobby Charlton rose highest in the box to glance a header into the far corner on 53 minutes. Benfica were able to sneak a late equaliser into force an extra 30 minutes, but United's superior fitness killed the game inside nine extra time minutes. George Best rounded the keeper for the second, Brian Kidd nodded in the third and Charlton struck a fourth. Manchester United were European champions. The victory was the overdue realisation of Samat Busby's dream after several semi-final knockdowns and a disaster that would bid goodbye to most people and most clubs. The dream was achieved by continuing the philosophy of the long departed James Gibson, with eight players produced by their own academy and half of those from the surrounding area. Of the European Cup victory, Bobby Charlton put it most succinctly. There was an understanding that something was over something that had dominated our lives for so long. George Best said similar, in a more lamenting fashion. He had effectively peaked aged just 22 when Manchester United ruled over Europe for the very first time and he wouldn't get much chance to do so again. When Matt Busby ended his 24-year reign at the club, it ultimately ended George Best's career, not only at Manchester United, but at top-level sport. Busby left his post the following year, achieving the European Cup win, a handful of league titles and a couple of FA Cup triumphs all on a net spend of roughly £12,000 a year. 31-year-old Wilf McGuinness was promoted from the academy, but was never truly in charge, with some at Busby becoming more of a general manager figure. It was only when Busby became more of a figurehead than a man who retained distinct power at the club that United could move on from his dynasty. Through relegation and promotion that quickly followed, as well as success on the fringes in the occasional FA Cup victory under the weight of Merseyside dominance, only when Alex Ferguson became manager were Manchester United back on top of the perch 